This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. All right, folks, before we get started with our next panel, I am going to attempt to read all of your minds. Are you ready? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to please choose any number, any secret number. Don't tell it to me or the people around you. Go ahead, write it down on your paper there. Just choose any number, any number, write it down. All right, I want you to take that number and add five. Add five, please. Okay, got it? Get your new answer and double it. Double it. Take your new answer and subtract four. Subtract four. Okay, take your new answer and divide it by two. Divide by two. And take your new answer and subtract your secret number, please. Take your new answer minus your secret number. Okay, circle your final answer, please. Circle your final answer. And on the count of three, I want you to shout out the number that you've circled. Are you ready? One, two, three. Three. <laughs> the math magician strikes again. Welcome back, folks, for our second panel discussion on quality STEM and STEAM criteria, uh, led by Pat Wayne of Arts Orange County. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pat Wayne. So I'm not going to sing, but I am going to do an interpretive dance. No. Um, so what the slide had on it was all the words we're hearing, STEM, STEAM, project-based learning, uh, design thinking, common core, local control funding formula. And all of those are in play. How do we know what quality is? How do we know what is the criteria by which a school or a district can claim to be STEAM? In my gut, I know we are on to something quite spectacular, a path that could make every school a creative incubator that kids just can't wait to get to every day. Who doesn't want that? We all know deep down that if we do this right, it can transform education, and it is exactly what business is saying, asking for, to ensure a creative workforce. I heard a superintendent say at a meeting that he would like to see kids run into school with the same energy they run away <laughs> out at the end of the day. Um, and looking at those kids from Eastlake High School, who, who of us could doubt their engagement and how um, connected they are to the, that high school experience because of what they're doing in dance. How many of you were unsure if that collision between the two dancers was planned or a mistake? Was anybody unsure about that? That girl and the way she recovered, that's an example of what happens in the arts. What business doesn't want that skill of recovery, failure, uh, something unexpected happens, and you turn it around? And she actually gave us a little shrug that bonded us to her, made us root for her. That's what the arts do. So um, I had this experience in my school life. And um, 
this engagement that I had came to me through the arts. And in fact, in eighth grade, my science teacher, who was teaching a geology unit, partnered with the arts teacher. And first, the arts teacher came in and gave us the arts rigor. And what the arts rigor was about was storyboarding and how you successfully create illustrations in a graphically organized way to tell a story, which was developed in the 1930s by Disney. Once we acquired those art skills, then the science teacher came in and they, uh, she assigned us a uh, rock, uh, a piece of geology. So I got sandstone. And here's what I remember. Sandstone is sand and quartz that is cemented together through heat and pressure. Comes in three colors, red, yellow, and brown. I chose yellow in my graphic uh, storyboarding. And Mr. Saunders taught you all about himself through six storyboard frames. That's the only thing I remember from my eighth grade year, is that, that lesson. We use sandstone all the time. It's a common building material in paving and uh, buildings. Um, my organization, Arts Orange County, we are the Countywide Arts Council. We are the primary advocate in our county, partnered with our very good partner, the Orange County Department of Ed, and I know Jim Thomas is here today, Jim, wave. We are joined at the hip to advocate for arts education and now STEAM. And we're experiencing a great deal of success but with that success comes a problem, which is once we have convinced the school board, the superintendent, the principal, their very first question is, well, how and how do I know I'm doing it well? Where are the models? What does quality look like? And what are the criteria that I can validate that I'm truly doing STEAM? An after-school robotics class, and then a claim that now we're a STEAM school, um, I, I have a problem with that. So I'm, I'm so pleased to welcome our panel today. And each one of them is going to tell you their story of how their work is touching on this issue of quality and criteria. So we're going to start with uh, Ellen Penensky, who is the um, executive director of the Science Alli San Diego Science Alliance and the STEM Collaboratory here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Paneski, and as Pat mentioned, I'm the executive director of the San Diego Science Alliance and a member of the San Diego STEM Collaboratory. Um, before I go on, I just wanted to take a little poll in the audience of how many of you in this audience went to school in San Diego County, to K-12 school in San Diego County? OK, and then how many of you work at a school in San Diego County? And how many of you have kids here at a school in San Diego County? Alrighty. So the San Diego STEM Collaboratory is a group, a collaborative effort where we envision a time that our innovation economy here in San Diego is fueled by that STEM talent developed in our local, local meaning San Diego County, K-16 um, educational pipeline. And that's, that's K-2 career pipeline. Now, what is San Diego County? If we're talking about um, envisioning this time, San Diego County is large. It might not necessarily be as large as LA County, um, but we have a, a GDP of $177.4 billion. These numbers come from the San Diego Region, uh, Regional Economic Development Corporation. And that is 16th in the nation. There are two other California cities that are a little bit higher than us. Any ideas who that could be? Uh, maybe Los Angeles, second at 765.7, and then maybe mm, perhaps San Francisco at 360. Um, so San Diego is 16th in the nation. 
In terms of venture capital dollars received in San Diego County, San Diego is sixth in the nation at 1.1 billion. Any guesses which county is the most in venture capital funds received? Silicon Valley, what do you know? 10.8. So Silicon Valley's 10.8, LA and Orange County combined, two is number, is number fourth in the nation and San Diego is sixth. We also have a half a million K-12 students in 42 school districts in our region, as well as 22,000 teachers, four major universities, seven community colleges, and then a handful of informal education um, institutions and nonprofits that help mobilize all of our efforts to build this innovation economy through teaching and learning. So our mission here at the San Diego STEM Collaboratory is to help our county prepare our most STEM capable graduates. And the, it doesn't, it can't be done alone. That's why it is called the San Diego STEM Collaboratory. So two years ago, Chris Rowe and Stephanie Couch came to the San Diego Science Alliance, um, who's been an organization that's been in business of connecting stakeholders regionally to advance STEM um, teaching and learning. And they came to us and said, hey, we're starting this movement around California. Do you want to join us? Well, of course, since we've been in this business, we said, well, if, sure, we'll help you. So what did we do? We went and gathered some people around the community and said, hey, California's starting this movement. We'd like to start this movement in our region. Do you want to join us? And that's how it began. Now, what is a movement and what is the point of this collaboration for collective impact? There is a multi-state strategic framework that went out talking about the three categories of networks, um, from cooperating to coordinating to collaborating. And right now, I would say the majority of the state, the majority of our region cooperates. You know, we, we get along, we all want to advance STEM teaching and learning in our region. Moving forward, coordinating takes a little bit more effort of partnering for programs, policies, community awareness to get everybody moving in the same direction. We're approaching the time of the collaborating. And collaborating, the key difference is collaborating is that same vision. The vision where we see that our innovative economy is propelled by kids that are educated in our local K-16 environment. So uh, is this going to work? I think it is. And the reason why I think this is going to work is because we're not alone. As a great poet, Maya Angelou said, but nobody can make it out here alone. We are connected as the San Diego STEM Collaboratory with CSLNet, you heard from Chris Rowe today, to anchor the South here in the state of California. And CSLNet is connected nationally, as you can see on the right-hand side, the national resources and partners that they value and that they use. So I can't tell you how many times I call up one of the other regional partners to say, hey, I need some data on this, or do you have an, an idea on that? Um, how do I move forward in this situation to help us all advance? The Stanford Social Innovation Review put out a report, and it's a, a little bit old now, in 2011, but it makes a lot of sense, and still makes a lot of sense, of collective success. Is that, again, we all need that common agenda, and I think that we're here because we all believe that together we can do more than alone um, to advance the needle. We need this shared measurement system. And one of the things that the San Diego STEM Collaboratory is working on is a quality criteria model, and John will talk about that next, um, to figure out how are we going to know if we're successful. Mutually reinforcing activities. The San Diego STEM Collaboratory put on, one of its outcomes was a, a STEM summit here in San Diego last year that brought together 150 people and over 50 partner entities within the county that all are looking for the same thing. We also held a few uh, Next Generation Science Standards community forums with industry partners here. One, Qualcomm hosted one. The maritime industry um, people hosted another to kind of get around this concept of how are we all going to move together. Continuous communication in the backbone support organizations, which all come from our collaborative partners. 
So I would like to invite you to join us in preparing San Diego County's most STEM-capable individuals. STEM and STEAM, as I'm coming, beginning to learn, are all rooted in the concept of the practice-based applications and the inquiry-based learning that's necessary for us to move as a community towards a larger goal. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> now John Spiegel, Science Coordinator at the San Diego Office of Education. Um, good morning, my name is John Spiegel. I'm the science coordinator at the San Diego County Office of Education. And, and a little bit about my background, which also I think comes into this idea of quality criteria. Prior to my new job I have now, I was a school site administrator uh, principal in San Diego Unified for um, at two different schools for seven years. And it was only in the last couple years that I was a principal that I actually started talking about this idea of STEM but in all of the schools I was working in, I was working hard with my staff to bring uh, STEM education to the school, whether it be an engineering program that we were working on or how we were developing our projects and our programs in our school. Um, about a, a little over a year ago, I was at my school site and uh, a school had contacted me about wanting to come and they had heard that we were doing this thing called STEM and they wanted to come see it. And I happily invited them in and we spent the day walking around the school showing them some of the things that we had been working on, the, the opportunities we were giving students. And at the end of the kind of the, the walk around, one of the, the uh, people who was part of the, the group said, so how did you become a STEM school? And my response was, well, one day we just decided we were going to be one. And then it was, so how, what, what, what criteria? How do you, what sets you out as a STEM school? And I didn't have an answer. Um, I had, I knew we were doing it. I had, we had been doing research. We had been bringing projects in, but we didn't have any way of actually accounting for that. So that flash forward about eight months later is a science coordinator and working with the collaboratory and engaging in this conversation around, so what does quality criteria look like? What does this, this happen? Schools would contact the county office and they would ask questions like, we're an elementary school, we wanna become a STEM school, how do we do it? And what do we do to get there? And, and um, it kind of set the stage that there's a need to help people to understand what does that mean? What does it look like? How do we improve those programs? So last November, um, a task force kind of began to assemble. Uh, people from the industry, from school sites, from uh, parent organizations, from teachers, principals, and we came together and we, we said, we're gonna, we're gonna create this quality criteria rubric. This is gonna be great. It's gonna take us about a year and we're gonna have this do document, this tool that schools can use. Um, and when you bring that many people together, and you start to talk about some of this stuff, you find out that there are a lot of ideas and a lot of um, interpretations, starting with the word STEM, <laughs> much less criteria and a rubric that would measure that. So we have been working since November through this process of defining what STEM is, what does it mean when we talk about going from STEM to STEAM? What are the attributes that make up a quality STEM program? So the way that we've been doing this is we have this ongoing task force that has met twice. We're meeting again in April. And then in between that time, we have a subset of people that form a work group that are basically people that are willing to come and do a lot of extra time. And uh, we come together and we are slowly chipping away at what this is. So at this point in the process, what we have is some big attributes for what quality STEM uh, programs look like. And some of those attributes, there's really three, but the first one is broken into two parts. Um, the first one is this idea of integrity of academic content, which is a fancy way of saying it's the work that's happening within the classroom that teachers are doing with kids every single day. The second part of that attribute one is the STEM climate and culture, and that's the part that's outside of the classroom, but it's on the campus itself. What is the school doing 
that's actually building this culture that makes something um, STEM. The second attribute is around the collaboration that needs to happen that's beyond the school, so it's reaching out into the community, into the industry, and how are we engaging that larger group within the context of a school. And the third attribute is that of connecting to either post-secondary or preparing students to be college and career ready. So within those three attributes, we have components that we are fleshing out, and um, everything from uh, what does it mean to do interdisciplinary or integrated learning, how does that look? Um, one thing that is really uh, part of this process is we, we realized early on that we cannot ask, uh, we can't have this STEM rubric over here when a large majority of the work that's happening in schools right now is about implementing the Common Core and implementing the next generation science standards. Whatever we develop has to work in tandem with each other. So what role do the standards play in helping us to bring forward a STEM program in a school? So where we are right now is we're currently kind of drafting the, the attributes, uh, the rubric that goes with that. We're bringing it back to our task force in April. And then we'll continue to do that process. And when that finishes, we want to put it out to the public, to the community, who can go in and just add any kind of comments they want, uh, feedback, things that we might be missing, things that we're not uh, looking at. and then. As we look at the fall, we are uh, looking for schools that are willing to kind of engage their staff with this quality criteria, bringing it in, uh, think, seeing how it works within the context of a school and the, and the goals that that school has, and then again, refining it. So um, what started off as a year project um, is looking like it's going to take a little longer, but I think it's what is necessary to take something as difficult as a quality criteria rubric and actually bring it to life. So that's the work we're doing. Next, I'd like to invite Heather Latimer, who is a professor at University of San Diego. Good morning, I think it's still morning. Uh, so, about two years ago at the University of San Diego, we started talking about creating an online master's program. This was relatively new territory for us, and we knew that we didn't just want to take our existing master's programs and slap them online. There's a lot of places that have done that, and there's reason for that, but we wanted to continue to grow and continue to evolve. So we started looking around at what are the different possibilities that are out there. And we'd had a strong program in STEM. But as we started having conversations, we, started kept, we kept hearing this buzz about STEAM. And we thought, OK, well, if there's a buzz, maybe, maybe we ought to consider it a little bit. And as we started to dig into that and really consider the possibilities, it ended up becoming something that became one of the specializations that we focus in in our online master's program. And it's actually become the most popular specialization that we have. In addition, as part of this work, we've been working with some schools, both in San Diego Unified, as well as a couple of other districts around the state of California, to work with their staff on how to implement and what STEAM looks like in their schools. Now this process has meant that we've had to do a lot of hard thinking about what exactly is STEAM, how is it different from STEM, and how do we make it meaningful for kids in classrooms and teachers in schools? So we have kind of three guiding principles that have focused our work, and I just want to share those with you because I think they're part of what for us is part of our quality criteria definition. So the first one is that STEAM is not just about slapping arts onto STEM. It really is about an inquiry orientation and starting from a place of asking questions and being thoughtful about how we're designing learning experiences in the classroom. And those of you who are math or science teachers or work with math and science teachers know that that is what we're supposed to be doing in math and science all along, but too often we get caught up in adding the knowledge and focusing on the content and not focusing on the inquiry. And by adding the arts in, by talking about STEAM, we really have a new 
opportunity to reconceptualize what good science and math learning looks like, to reconceptualize about how we're engaging students in the classroom, and to think about asking those questions, thinking about things from multiple perspectives, representing things in different ways, and having new ideas. And so it's an opportunity to really take the next generation science standards, the common core standards, and think about not just what are the knowledge that students have to take away from these, but what are the questions that we can ask? How can we create creative and innovative opportunities in the classroom and culture and inculcate students with the desire to have creativity and innovation in their own experiences? So that, that's one guiding principle that we've really worked on. Um, the second is that if we're going to do that, it can't be about one teacher working by themselves. And we've heard that from our, our previous speakers as well. Uh, um, this isn't just about saying we're going to have one teacher in their own classroom working. And in order to have collaboration, we need to give teachers time. And I know that in John, in your previous schools, one of the things that was really a priority was making sure that within the school day, there is time for teachers to collaborate, to sit down to really think about what these ideas are, how to make them meaningful, how to give kids learning opportunities in their individual classrooms, and how to connect content across classrooms. And whether you're in an elementary school and it's a team of third and fourth grade teachers collaborating, or you're in a high school and it's a science and math, a history, an English, and an arts teacher collaborating all together across the disciplines, there are opportunities for really sitting down and thinking and having that meaningful conversation that if you miss it, it's never going to be the same to just purchase a curriculum that is prepackaged. You have to have those rich conversations. And whether that's in our master's classes or whether that's in school sites, it's something that in order for us to make meaning of this, we've got to give people those opportunities to talk. And then the third piece is that assessment matters. And I think this is kind of where the rubber hits the road and where we're starting to see some of the conversations and pushback on Common Core and some of the bigger national conversations. If we do this great work, but at the end of the day, we are still assessing using benchmark tests and end of the year standardized tests that prioritize simply regurgitating content, then none of the work will be prioritized. And so we have to have those conversations both, again, within our individual classrooms and schools, as well as in larger entities across districts and across the state and across the nation of how are we going to assess this. And that's really tough, because part of STEAM is about innovation. How do you assess a child's innovation? How do you put that on a rubric? I don't have all the answers for that. I think those answers need to be developed in conversations with teachers. But if we don't say that we need to have this as an assessment category, as something that matters in how we're looking at kids learning, then it's not going to be taught and it's not going to be prioritized in schools. So that's kind of a little snapshot of where we are with what we're doing, uh, both in our online program as well as with our work with schools. Uh, um, but I think that I, I hope we'll have further opportunities for conversation. Uh, um, it's certainly a rich and it's a very, very exciting area. And there's, again, as, as Pat pointed out in the beginning, there's all these different pieces that are coming together right now that really provide these rich opportunities for having discussions around how to make learning more meaningful for our kids in schools. So thank you. And Denise Grande, Director of Arts Education for the Los Angeles Cultural Arts Commission. Good morning. So as the Director of Arts Education for the LA County Arts Commission, um, I've come to this place of starting to, framing, to frame our work as su directly supporting school districts and schools, and then all of the other kind of work that we do that offers indirect support to school districts. And I think today here, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what kind of indirect support is starting to happen on the STEAM front, uh, and then how it connects uh, cross county. So as the Director of Arts Education uh, for the LA County Arts Commission, I oversee an initiative called Arts for All. Uh, it is an initiative of county government uh, back in 2002, so more than a decade ago, the LA County Board of Supervisors uh, came forward and said, you know, we appoint the arts commissioners for LA County, and we appoint the school board members of the LA County Office of Education. 
it seems to us that these two entities maybe could do some good by working together to help drive arts education in all 81 school districts in LA County. Uh, so we launched in 2002. We, uh, to reference Ellen, with some of the stats that Ellen was talking about, we have approximately 2,400 schools across 4,000 square miles and serve 1.6 million students. LA Unit Unified often gets uh, the media attention as being the LA school district, but it is a third of our student population and one of 81 school districts. Flash forward 10 years later, in um, late 2012, the LA STEM Hub was being launched, and it's an uh, initiative of the chamber there. And they hosted a brown bag lunch meeting where they were inviting community stakeholders to give some input about how they might go about this launch. Uh, funny enough, funny enough, uh, there were a number of arts education funders in that room, and they also are STEM funders. So fortunately, I think, they started raising their hands, saying, you know, there's some folks who've been at this arts thing for a while, are you talking to them? Uh, later that afternoon, our office got a call from Boeing, and the conversation went a little like this. We do a lot of funding for arts education, and we do a lot of funding in the STEM sector. For Boeing, it's a workforce development issue. And we just, and they said to us, we just think that maybe we can make more headway if we're having conversations together and we're not off working in different silos. So I just want to quote a representative from Boeing who I think says it better than I could ever come up with. Uh, and she said, we can teach our workforce to write code. What we need is employees who can imagine what to write code for. So Boeing was funding a lot in, Orange, in LA County. They said, we also fund a lot in Orange County, so can we not only bring these two different sectors together, but can we bring these two counties together? And that's how the Arts Plus STEM Collaborative for 21st Century Learning, not as good a name as the STEM Collaboratory, um, came together. So it is, uh, so the three counties all have established arts education initiatives. In LA, it's Arts for All. In Orange County, it's Arts Advantage. And here in San Diego, you have Arts Empower, I think was launched last year or the year before. There, are a, there is a STEM hub in each county, but they're very different. In LA, it's out of the chamber. In Orange County, it's really an initiative of a funding collaborative. And here in San Diego, my sense is that it's more driven by the science education community. So we have different perspectives. Um, and while in LA, the arts education initiative has been around a little bit longer, in San Diego, the STEM education uh, piece has a lot more legs under it. You've been at it a, long, uh, a lot longer. So there's this great opportunity to share history, resources, and thinking. So we really, at this point, are a think tank. Uh, so we're just finishing kind of our first year of working together. And I really want to echo and reinforce something that Ellen brought forward, which is this idea of cooperating, coordinating, and collaborate, collaborating. So we're a think tank made up of the three offices of education, uh, the three arts entities in each county, and the three STEM entities in each county, plus invited member leaders from the arts, higher ed, and STEM uh, science communities. While there are some relationships that exist, for the most part, these are all brand new relationships. A group of 30 to 40 people sitting in a room who may have known each other, but have not really worked together in deep ways, with a few exceptions. Uh, we are very much in the cooperating and starting to coordinate phase. And I want to just bring forward a quote by another smart colleague who I think was quoting, quoting Daniel Pink, but said that change happens at the speed of trust. And we are definitely um, in the throes of establishing that trust. 
we spent a good chunk of time talking and we're trying to move beyond the talking to really try to imagine what we could do together that we can't do alone. Uh, the, the gut default was maybe we should write integrated curriculum and then it's like really, is that really what we should be doing? So trying to elevate it to um, you know, a 30,000 foot level, what can we do systems wide that will indirectly move the ball forward because there are so many people on the ground in the classrooms trying to work it at that level. So we, uh, as you will see, and the, so this card handout um, is the initial kind of tracking point of where we are now. Um, and on there, you'll get a sense of where we are in terms of what's our vision, what are we even trying to do as a collaborative, and uh, to echo some of the other panelists here, how do we even define STEAM and STEAM instruction and, and what's it gonna mean for moving forward? So our goals for this next year, trying to uh, really stick to what can we do in 2014, is we really are hoping to build on the good work of San Diego and the STEM quality criteria and attributes and take that a step further to what would that mean for STEAM, uh, optimal arts and STEAM instruction and environments. And then using that to identify high quality models throughout the region, because it's one thing to have a theoretical framework, it's quite another to be able to point to concrete examples of where it's working well so that others can learn from those models. We um, also were working together to collaboratively develop and implement and support arts and STEM programming cross county, uh, and today is an example of that. STEAM Connect absolutely taking the lead on that, but knowing that the other two counties were right there to support and help in whatever way we can. And there are other uh, uh, convenings planned for LA, and there will be for Orange County as well this year. And then finally, just begin to build tools that can help us communicate about this initiative, about this collaborative, and about how these different sectors really can do more together and um, working together than any of us can do alone. And hope for, hope for more as we move forward. And I, I just have to say as the arts voice here, um, we're really excited about the Common Core Standards, thrilled about the Next Generation Science Standards, but have to mark the, the, the time also that the National Course um, Art Standards are going to be related, uh, released later this year. So it really is a time of synergy for all of these things to work together. Thanks, so um, we're going to do a little hands-on activity right now. If you pull out your paper bag, there is um, two pipe cleaners in there. And you're gonna choose one. You're gonna choose one pipe cleaner. We're just gonna do a little refre brain refresher before we get to the Q&A. So choose whichever one you want. And there's two goals of working with your first pipe cleaner. Um, besides the fact that you're just gonna be working alone, so not talking to your neighbor, you're gonna bend the pipe cleaner into an abstract shape. And it can be any size, and what abstract means is that it, the artist uses uh, this visual language of shape and form to, uh, that does not uh, is not representational. So I don't want to see it, a heart or a flower. It's an abstract shape. And the second thing that I would like you to accomplish is to create negative space, a closed negative space. So that means that at some part of your folding this into an abstract shape, there is some section that is closed so th this concept of negative space is throughout the arts. In music and theater, you might say that the negative space is the impact of a silent moment. In dance, the dancer uses their body to create negative space. So this is a closed negative space in here. So just take 10 seconds and fold your pipe cleaner into an abstract shape. 
with at least one closed negative space. Okay, no right or wrong to this. Now, after, as you've accomplished that, you're gonna take the second pipe cleaner and you're gonna attach it to your first one to create a structure that is freestanding. And you're gonna test it on your lap or on the floor and that you want this structure to be able to stand up on its own by creating balance. And once you've accomplished that, connect with one or two neighbors and hook your sculptures together. Collaborate to hook them together. So just very quickly with your partners, talk about how this is just a simple example of some of the things you've either heard talked about or your understanding of the processes of steam. What happened in this little simple quick exercise? Okay, let's uh, come back together. Um, would anyone like to share anything you talked about in your group? Yes, great. So I don't know if you could hear him, he talked about it first, it was creative, you could do anything you wanted, and then as soon as I gave you the task of making it stand up and balanced, it shifted into engineering. I know when the, our panelists were trying to do theirs, they, the, in the placement of the fourth sculpture, they all were coaching John on maybe it could, <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> but but and he was he he wasn't taking the first suggestion. He was experimenting, and then he made his decision. Okay, so now we have about I think eight minutes uh, for Q and A. So, uh, what questions do you have for the panelists? I, I just wanted to add to the, the piece you just oh, mentioned. I think that that project also, um, I see how for a student who's interested in a science field that it's interesting for them to explore the art side of things. But for a student who is an artist and who's going to pursue, be, be being pursuing a career in, in sculpture, um, it's important for them to be able to have the experience of thinking about what happens when your idea becomes three-dimensional and the engineering aspects that you have to consider as a maker of something, as someone making something with their hands. So I think that that kind of an exercise goes mm. both ways. You know, um, you're making me think about something really important too that I'm really challenging this concept of arts being a justification for the arts is for that at-risk child who somehow doesn't fit into anything else. Because for business, a lot of times they see the creative as somebody uh, difficult, um, maybe defensive, kind of uh, not collaborative. And I think this opportunity with STEAM gives us a chance with the kids who this is their thing, and maybe they are at risk, but they are, they are widened and become more well-rounded through this STEAM approach and creative thinking and collaboration. Um, that it, it uh, uh, just fills them out as a human being. And that maybe then they pursue the arts, but they're, a better human being and their approach to it. Sure, and I also think that um, you know, having art and science taught to an artist 
to an art to a student who is an artist, um, having those skills of art and science uh, taught to them, applied through their area of study is much more beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they can make the connection. I'm an art professor at a college, and I'm also a working artist. And so we're getting the students that have come through a K through 12 system. And um, you know, I, I think it's an important thing for them to have that connection and to feel um, that those skills mean something to them in the area that they want to pursue. So not only thinking about art as a supplement for science education, for critical thinking, but vice versa. Also thinking about for the students studying art, that these science and math skills and engineering skills and understanding of technology is a good supplement and has a symbiotic relationship with their field of study as well. Do I? Can I, um, I just want to comment on that. Um, at the LA County Arts Commission, we have a civic arts department where we commission artists to make art in public spaces um, as a, a permanent way of um, creating a cultural environment and physical space. And whether it is a two-dimensional piece of artwork or a three-dimensional piece of artwork, whether it's a painted mural that needs to be mounted on panels so that it could be put in a historic building, um, the fabrication, the engineering, the moving of the piece of art, the engineering involved in that and, um, is, is without exception, even when it, uh, I'm thinking most recently about huge glass panels that were installed at the top of a new structure for a pool. It was a county pool facility. And these amazing work panels of glass. And they weren't, you know, they had to be fabricated, they had to be moved. And it was really the artist who has to be the one that carries the ball and making sure that it all happens well and correctly. So circling back to our topic now of quality, criteria, um, a takeaway I have is that we're all building the plane while we're flying it. You know, really, we're, we're, we're people are like there and want it and we're trying to figure out what does quality look like. And John, I just wanted to ask you, have you seen other countries or other parts of this country that have, are ahead of where we are on a rubric or criteria that is informing your work? Yeah, so um, when we started the process, part of the research part for the task force was to look at what's been happening around the country. So there are several other states that have rubrics or, or different forms of, of criteria. And that was part of our question is, what, what parts of those are we, are we borrowing because they make sense? And which parts do we need to add on our own because that represents what we're trying to design? So I think there are models all around the country of people who are going down the road but they don't necessarily apply directly to us here. We have to do our own version for, for San Diego. Question there. Um, as a parent and a community leader, um, one of the questions I have is how are we going to be defining quality? Um, a quality education is very essential to me as a parent and my children and finding the right school and the right fit. So how is quality going to be defined in this arena of STEAM? That's a good one. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? I don't know if I have an answer, but I will add one piece that, is, that, that we're considering as this process, is there are schools out there that want to be called a STEM focus, or you know, really put themselves out as a STEM or a STEAM school. But when we look at the standards and we look at the expectations for the standards, I kind of wonder, aren't all students supposed to have a STEM educational experience. So, so as we look at our rubric, we're actually trying to take into account this idea of what does it mean to have that STEM for all is not the top of the rubric. STEM for all is really the middle. It's the part that we expect all schools and all students to have an opportunity with. And then how do we build beyond that for that school that wants to, to really kind of define themselves with that? So it's one of the challenges that we're, we're working on. Yeah. Can, 
I was going to add to that. Uh, I, I think that it, as a parent, going and looking at schools, regardless, it's, it's not about the label. And it's certainly not about, not about the number that's published in the newspaper. You know, there's the ethic of care that matters almost more than anything else. Do, the, do I get a sense when I walk on campus that the teachers in this school care about my child? And as a parent, that's my number one criteria. And then from there, what is the child like? What are the classrooms like? What are the learning environments like? And who are the kids who are here? One of our favorite schools when we're looking at placing our student teachers are the high-tech high schools. And they're not the only places. There's a lot of great schools out there. But one of the things that's remarkable when you walk on the campuses at the high-tech high, and it's all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade, is that those kids can come up to you and they'll tell you about what they're working on. And as a teacher educator, I've found that one of the best ways to get a sense of a school is you walk in a classroom, you say to a kid, so tell me what you're learning about. And it's amazing the number of kids in classrooms that will say, I don't know. So I think that you know, th those, those results are really hard to publish in a newspaper. But as a parent and, and as a teacher, as an educator, that's what I care about more than anything, is do, the, do I get the sense that the teachers care? And when I talk to the kids, are they excited about what they're learning about? Can they articulate their learning? And if they can meet those two criteria, I think that says a whole lot about that school. And just with the opportunities right now, with the parent voice being, um, being a required being required to be included in the LCAP process, uh, it is a time for parents to step forward about what they would like to see and to define what we all think quality education should look like. All right, could we give our panelists a high quality round of applause, please? Thank you.